Today's scripture comes from Luke 12, 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You may be seated. As we get seated, let me pray for us. Gracious, loving Father, we thank you this Pentecost Sunday for the gift of your Spirit. And we ask now that your Spirit would be with us to help your word live to us to make us to become more like you. And would you be with the children downstairs as well, that they would also see wondrous things in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, again, good morning. It's so wonderful to gather with each of you here this morning. We're in our series on the parables of Jesus, stories that Jesus told to teach us how to live in the light of God's kingdom. Today, we're going to look at the parable that is known as the parable of the rich fool. The parable of the rich fool is one of Jesus' most famous teachings on wealth and possessions. And so, it's, it's, a, it's a teaching that is relevant to all of us today in Vancouver, isn't it? Because many of us, perhaps all of us, we're, we're wrestling with problems to do with money, aren't we? We wrestle with not having enough money, with how to get more money, and perhaps even to how to faithfully steward the money that God has blessed us with. Sometimes our problem is not with money, but over money. Disputes and arguments with business partners and friends and perhaps even family over money. And that's actually the problem that opens our passage today. Our plan for today is to just walk through the passage from start to end, and we're going to look at, we're going to have three points to help us keep track of where we are and where we're going. Three points, the problem, the heart of the problem, and the solution to the problem. The problem, the heart of the problem, and the solution to the problem. So first, the problem, and let me just give some context to set up our passage. Thousands of people have gathered to see Jesus and to hear him teach. But while Jesus is teaching, someone in the crowd brings a problem to him. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. We can see what the problem is. The problem is over money. And we, we, can, we can surmise that the father had died without li- leaving a will. And so there were no instructions on how to divide his money between his two sons. In the culture at the time, the older brother had the rights. It was the older brother who took the lead in dividing the estate, in dividing the father's money, and it seems that he's dragging his feet. It seems that it's the younger brother who goes to Jesus and then tells Jesus to tell the older brother to divide in the inheritance. See, someone goes to Jesus and tells Jesus to tell the older brother to divide in the inheritance. And already, we need to notice something here, don't we? The younger brother doesn't go to Jesus to ask him what to do. He goes to Jesus to tell him what to do. Look again at verse uh, 13, where he says to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. The man faces a problem over money, but he goes to Jesus having already decided what the solution should be. And I wonder if that's something that we need to hear for ourselves today. The man addresses Jesus as teacher, but he treats him as a servant. And I wonder, might we do that sometimes? We might address Jesus as teacher. We might address Jesus as king, perhaps even Lord. 
But then, do we then just treat Jesus as a servant? When we have a problem, we don't go to Jesus asking what we should do. We go to Jesus telling him what he should do. And so what does Jesus do in our passage? Jesus firmly pushes back. Look at verse 14. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? The man has reduced Jesus to just someone who judges, someone who solves money problems between people. And so Jesus pushes back because Jesus is much more than that, isn't he? Perhaps Jesus is pushing the man to ask the question, who is Jesus? Christ City, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Because it's good to bring our problems to Jesus. It's good to bring our dreams and hopes and plans and aspirations to Jesus. But we need to be clear when we do so, who is Jesus? Because Jesus is more than a judge. He's more than just someone who can solve our problems for us. He's not just some genie whose job it is to give us whatever we ask for. He's the creator of the universe. He's the king of the universe. He calls us to submit to him as king. Submitting to Jesus as king means that we don't tell him what to do. He tells us what to do. But Here's the thing, Jesus is a king unlike any other, isn't he? Because Jesus doesn't just demand that we submit. He doesn't just call us to submit, even though he is very well within his rights to. No, Jesus doesn't do that because he's a different kind of king. He's a gentle king. He's a gracious king who doesn't just tell us to submit. He shows us why. He reassures us. He shows us that we can trust him. He doesn't just say, trust me. He says, you can trust me. And here's why you should trust me. Because he is wiser than us. Because he's more powerful than us. And he is good and will always do what is good. Jesus' solutions to our problems will always be better than the ones we can cook up on our own. Christ City, who is Jesus? When we bring our problems to Jesus, do we tell him, what he should do, or do we ask him what we should do? So back to our passage. Jesus, in true Jesus fashion, doesn't answer the problem the man presents to him. He gets to the heart of the problem, which is our second point, the heart of the problem. The man thinks the problem is over money, but Jesus knows that the heart of the problem is something else entirely. Jesus knows that the heart of problem is something much deeper, something much more pressing, and that's what he addresses. Look at verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus gets to the heart of the problem, which he identifies as covetousness. To be covetous means to be greedy to constantly want more and more, even when you don't need it. To think that your life is about having more and more, having an abundance of possessions. To think that you would only be truly happy if you only had that one more thing. Greed is taking that one extra portion when you're already full. Covetousness is buying a car and then immediately wanting the newer model. Covetousness is buying that phone and then immediately scrolling through the adverts because you want to get the next newest one. And then Jesus tells a parable to explain what covetousness and greed look like. I'm going to read it out again for us from verse 16. And Jesus told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample, which means enough. You have enough goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up for himself, for, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Could we please leave this slide up here for just a few moments because I want us to notice some things here that we can see in the text. 
The first is this, and some of us may have noticed it already. Notice how the rich man takes credit for his possessions, and so he assumes that everything belongs to him. We see the end of verse 17, which is in the middle of the third line. I have nowhere to store my crops. And then, and then verse 18, he goes on to say, I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And then I will store all my grain and my goods. My, my, my. The man thinks that everything belongs to him. He thinks that everything belongs to him because he thinks he can take credit for all that he's produced. He thinks he's the one who has earned all these possessions. And there's so much irony, isn't there? Because look at how Jesus opens the passage. He opens the parable by saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. Jesus is intentional here. It's not the man who produced it, it's the land who produced it. The man was taking credit for what was not his to take credit for. And so he had made the mistake of thinking that all he had rightly belonged to him. Christ City, have we been taking credit for what is not ours to take credit for? Do we look at our possessions and think that they are mine? Or do we know that they are God's? We work hard, yes. We, we make right decisions, yes. We, 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 we capitalize on circumstances. We do our due diligence. We may even have taken a calculated risk. And these often pay off, yes. But do we acknowledge that everything we have even our ability to work hard, all our circumstances, they are a gift that we don't deserve. One way to help us diagnose who we truly believe our possessions belong to is to look at how generous we are. How easily we give away what we have. Because in many ways, generosity is the opposite of covetousness. Covetousness looks to take. Generosity looks to give. Covetousness looks to keep for myself. Generosity looks to bless others. We struggle to be generous when we think we've earned what we have and so everything that we have belongs to us because we think we deserve what we have to keep and enjoy. And so this parable calls us to ask ourselves, the possessions they have, are they my possessions or are they God's possessions? The possessions that I have that are in my name, that I have private property rights over, do they belong to me or do they belong to God? And at this point, I just need to say, I'm so thankful to be part of a generous church. When, when, when my, our family joined this church four years ago, I, I remember being shocked at how generous our church is. Every time there is a need, time and time again, so many of you are so quick to give so generously. As I've gotten to know our elders in the way that they lead the church and live their lives, God has been using them to challenge me on how should I, how can I lead and live as though nothing I have belongs to me. I mean, I, I, I've learned that generosity is baked into the very DNA of our church. The, the fact that Christ City has this building in the first place is because of the generosity of South Hill Church. South Hill Church gifted us this building. They didn't see this building as something they owned. They saw it as a gift from God. They were called to be generous with. And as I've lived longer and longer in Vancouver, as, as I find out how much land is actually worth in this city, more and more do I realize what South Hill Church did makes no sense at all. And that's exactly why their gospel generosity is such a powerful illustration of the gospel in our city. Isn't it? In a culture that is all about taking what you deserve, radical generosity is about giving even those who do not deserve. And so generosity is a powerful, apologetic illustration of who God is because that's what God does, doesn't he? 
What is the gospel? The gospel is that God gave His only Son so that He would die for the sins of all those who don't deserve it. We can only be generous because of God's lavish generosity with us. And so Jesus is getting us to dig deeper and deeper into the heart of the problems we face with money. When, when we struggle with covetousness, we need to see that we, when we struggle with generosity, we, see, we need to see that it's, when we dig deeper, it's because we take credit for our possessions. When we struggle with greed, when we dig deeper, we need to see it's because we put our security in our possessions. And that's the other thing we notice in this passage, how the rich man's greed is also driven by his security that he gets from his possessions. Look at verse 18 again. And he said this, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. The man has done all his calculations. He may have even gone to see a financial advisor. He has stored up all the provision and possessions he needs to have, he could ever need, and so he thinks he's utterly secure. He's set for life. He can just relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And then look how God responds. Verse 20, But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? The man is called a fool because he has left God out of the picture. Verse 20 echoes another book of the Bible, the book of Psalms, Psalms 14 verse 1, which says this, The fool says in his or her heart, there is no God. The man was a fool because he left God out of the picture. The man comes to Jesus with a problem and Jesus is digging deeper and deeper and deeper into the heart of the problem. The man's covetousness and greed come from taking credit for his possessions. They come from putting his security in his possessions. But as we dig deeper and further still, we see that we take credit for our possessions, we put our security in our possessions when we leave God out of the picture. Some of us would have noticed it uh, already, that the entire parable is a conversation with himself. I, me, my, living life and making plans, only focusing on himself. That's why he took credit for his possessions, because he didn't see that everything, everything belongs to God. That's why he places his security in his possessions, because he didn't see that true security doesn't come from possessions, it comes only from God. But I want us to be really careful here about drawing the correct conclusions from this parable. Parables are stories with a specific purpose. And, and we can see that the purpose of this parable is to show the foolishness of covetousness, of greed that comes from leaving God out of the picture. But I also want us to be careful not to take away what the parable is not saying. The parable is not saying that it's wrong to plan ahead. It's saying that it's foolish to plan with God out of the picture. The parable is not saying that it's wrong to save for a rainy day. It's saying that it's foolish to think that money can save you from all the storms of life. The parable is not saying that it's wrong to tell your boss that you want a pay raise. I remember I used to work in a company where if you didn't ask, you never got. And... and, and God's Word is not telling us to just be a doormat that everyone walks over. That's not what it's calling us to do. It's not wrong to invest in a larger property. No, it's not wrong. It's not wrong to, to look for a different job. It's not wrong to invest and be wise with the money you have, but it is foolish to be driven by greed. Do you see the difference? As it gets to the heart of the problem, God's Word is calling us not to look at what we do first, but at why we're doing it. God is not just getting at the problem, it's getting to our heart. Proverbs 21, 20 says this, Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. A wise person saves up, saves up treasure 
and oil, but a foolish person doesn't save at all. Proverbs 27 verse 12 says this, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. The wise person plans ahead. The wise person plans ahead and takes actions to plan ahead. But a foolish person does not. None of us, and I say this very clearly, none of us should go away from this passage thinking that the point is that we don't need to be financially responsible. None of us should go away thinking that we don't need to plan for the future. None of us should think, I should stop caring about repaying my debt and just live life assuming God will give me whatever I want. God calls us to be wise with our finances. God calls us to plan ahead. And Lord willing, we plan to have a course just on this topic, on the topic of finances on, in the fall. The point of this parable isn't that it's wrong to build bigger barns, it's that it's wrong to build bigger barns without God in the picture. And I wonder how many of us might need to hear this today. I know I do. The thing about uh, preaching on a passage is that you can't just avoid the passage. And, And this week, as I've prepared to preach, I've had to ask myself, do I believe this? God has been calling me to get to the heart of the problems I face over my possessions, asking me, have I left God out of the picture? Do I take credit for my possessions? Do I put my security in my possessions? Because we see this parable calls us to apply God's word, not just to the problems we face with money, but it calls us to dig deeper and deeper till we get to the heart of the problems we face with money, to how we might be leaving God out of the picture. The problems we are facing with money right now, I know we all are, how might God be using that problem to get to our heart? Because if you think about it, God could solve the problem right now. Overnight, he could take all the problems away, but why does he leave them there? Well, I would say one reason It's because money is not the priority. He wants to get to our heart. When we think about how we want to get more money, do we do so with the trust that ultimately God is the one who provides for our every need? As we think about our every need, do we need to change what our perspective on what we really need? As we disciple our children and our loved ones, might we be putting an unhealthy emphasis on school, on career, on arts, on music, on sports? An unhealthy emphasis on the things that we think provide true security for our children. When we think about how God wants us to steward the money we have, even think about how God may be calling us to give away some of what we have, do we do so with the understanding that ultimately everything we have is God's? When we have problems and disputes over money, are we driven by a desire to get what we deserve? This morning, might God be calling us to perhaps give up some of what we deserve for the sake of the gospel? I want to apply this parable specifically to two issues that that some of us are dealing with. The first is in the area of of dating and marriage and family life. And I want to be clear, these are complex issues with many, many considerations to think about that I don't have time to go through. But we need to see that faithful application of this passage, faithfully following God's word in this area, means that we have to think and be honest with ourselves? Are we making unwise choices, perhaps even sinful choices in our relationships, in our family life, because we have left God out of the picture? I want to say this as gently and as sensitively as possible, but also as clearly as possible. Financial considerations are not reason enough to have living living arrangements that are dishonoring God. Financial considerations are not reason enough to have living arrangements that are downright disobedient to God. And I I want to say, 
There are many considerations here. And if you feel you're wrestling with it, come and talk to us. Let, let your family walk alongside you as you think through this. When we have difficulty resting, when we take on rhythms that are, that are unhealthy and impact our family life, might we be putting our security in our possessions instead of God? When we think about hustle culture, when we think about doing more and more and more, is it because we think security comes in having more and more and more? A reason that we struggle with rest is because we take credit for all that we produce. In many ways, the discipline of resting is a discipline of trust. To trust that my provision doesn't come from myself, it comes from God. When we are planning for the future, when we are deciding how much we need to be financially secure, might we be setting the bar too high because we are driven by wants rather than needs? For those of us who are dating, and I'm going to say this very gently, I just need to point out that, date, that there are costs to dating longer than you need to. The other issue I want to apply this parable to is to the issue of affordability, deciding where to live. And I say this from experience. Uh, my wife and I, we've been looking for a house to rent and <laughs> rental prices are going crazy. <laughs> As Vancouver gets more and more expensive, as we think about where to live, and perhaps even whether to stay in Vancouver or to move somewhere more affordable, this parable encourages us to think about not just where do we want to live, but where does God want us to live? Where is God in the picture when we are thinking about where to live? For some of us, our family and financial circumstances may well mean that we simply can't afford to live in Vancouver, and that's completely fine. God may well be using your circumstance to move you to where you need to go, and that's good and obedient to follow His call. But for some of us, God may be calling us to stay and to do what we need to do in order to follow His call and to live where He wants us to live. There are many considerations here, but I just want to put this to us from God's Word. Today's parable calls us to ask ourselves, is God in the picture when we are deciding where to live? So first, the problem. Second, the heart of the problem. And now we get to the third point, the solution to the problem. To summarize what we've learned so far, the man isn't a fool because he is rich. He's a fool because he has left God out of the picture. The man isn't a fool because he is rich. He's a fool because he doesn't realize that all his riches come from God. He doesn't realize that his riches come from God and so they are to be used for God. And he doesn't realize that true riches can only come from God. That's why he's a fool. Look at how the parable is summarized in verse 21. So is the one who lays up for himself and is not, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. To be rich toward God means to live with God in the picture. It means to realize that our riches come from God, that whatever we have is to be used for God, and that true riches can only come from God. The placement of this parable is really important because we, we, we are, we're supposed to read Scripture in light of this context. And so we need to read this passage in light of the passage that comes after and it actually really helps to clarify what is being said. Let me read some of the passage that comes after verse 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, that means dressed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink. I just want to point out, I don't think it's a coincidence that eating and drinking are here. And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And I just, before we go on, I just want to say, 
It's almost as if Jesus knows that uh, one of the reasons we struggle with giving away is we're worried we won't have enough. It's almost as if he knows that our struggle with, with giving till he, it hurts is that we're worried who provided up, provide for me when I run out. Jesus says, have faith. And he goes on, verse 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I'm going to read that again. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there, your, there will your heart be also. Christ City, God isn't some dictator, some tyrant who comes with us with a stick and saying, give me all you have. He isn't, he isn't just some person who comes and says, obey me or else. No, we see in the tone, don't we? He's a gentle, loving Savior who puts his arm around us and says, fear not. He's not a dictator, he's a shepherd and we are his flock, we're his little flock. Do you see the tenderness in the language there? He is our good shepherd. He is our father whose good pleasure it is to give us the kingdom. And remember, how did he give us the kingdom? Because he sent his own son to die for us. If God did not even spare his own son, how much more will he provide for our every need? So Christ City, where is our treasure? Is our treasure on earth or is our treasure in God's kingdom? When we, make, when we plan for the future, do we, plan, do we just stop at our plans at this kingdom or in the kingdom to come? Do we trust that God is our good shepherd who knows all that we need? Do we, do we realize that he's the creator of the universe who can and will give us everything we could need? Do we trust that when we seek his kingdom, all these things will be added to us. We read it, do we believe it? Because faith isn't just in what we say, it's in how we live. Faith doesn't just say, I'm a follower of Christ. Faith is in following Jesus. Being rich toward God means seeing the treasures that God has already given us in his kingdom. Being rich toward God means using what God has given us on this earth for His kingdom and trusting that God will always provide for our every need. When we see that all that God has given us, when we see that all He gave up to give us all that He has, we, we see something radically different. The Christian life is no loss. When, when you have everything we, when we could have everything we could need. It is not, you're not actually giving up anything. The thought occurred to me as you were singing the songs just now, is Jesus enough? When we get to heaven and we see Jesus, do we go, you are enough? Or do we go, where's my riches? <laughs> to end, I want to focus on a word, or two words at the end of verse 19, the idea of being merry, where the man celebrates his earthly riches. Look at verse 19 again. And he says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Be merry. And that's what I want to focus on. In the book of Luke, the word that is translated here, be merry, in verse 19, occurs only in two other instances. It appears in chapter 16, where it's used in a similar way to our parable to describe a foolish and excessive use of wealth. But you want to know where else, where's the other place it appears? It appears in another parable, the parable of the prodigal son the parable that we preached a couple of weeks ago. 
I'm going to look at it, but I just want to give a context again. The son has broken his father's heart by demanding his inheritance. He has shamed his father publicly. He has run away, but then he hit rock bottom. He has come to his senses and he comes back to say sorry. He comes back to say, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Can you make me a servant? And <laughs> the father doesn't even hear the apology. He just says, come here. The father throws a huge feast to celebrate. And that's where you pick up the story, verse 22. And the word that is translated as be merry in our passage is the same word that is translated as to celebrate in this passage we're going to read. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry, to celebrate. Christ City, God calls the man a fool for celebrating his earthly riches, not because it's foolish to celebrate, but because we have something far more valuable to celebrate. God is not against celebrating. He's just saying, look forward to the ultimate celebration we have. Let's not celebrate the wrong thing. Christ City, the word celebrate points forward to the ultimate celebration we will have. So let's not celebrate earthly riches. Let's celebrate the only thing, the only one worth celebrating. And what is that? What, is, what, what do we celebrate? We celebrate the fact that we were lost, but now we have been found. We celebrate the fact that we were blind, but now we see. Even though we did not deserve, even though we do not deserve, even though we could never deserve, God in His gracious generosity sent His only Son to die for us, to pull us in to the greatest celebration we could ever be a part of. We celebrate not the security of earthly riches, but the joy and security of the heavenly riches we already have in Christ. The solution to the problem of greed is to see how rich we already are and to see how much it cost Christ to give us those riches. And so in response, let us use what God has given us, not for ourselves, but for the glory of our Savior, for the glory of the one who died for us to bring us into the ultimate celebration in His kingdom. Let's stand as we respond to God's word.